Please, Marco. Okay, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Please. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, let me share the screen. Okay. Okay, is it okay? Yes, okay. Good. Okay, so hi everyone. Thanks for the invitation. So yes, in this uh, talk, I will um, expose uh, a proposal that we have with uh, Damian Anselmi uh, on how to treat this uh, theory with four derivatives and uh, uh, turn ghost into something else, which uh, we call purely virtual quantum or facons. And we're gonna explain along the talk uh, uh, how to implement them in a quantum field theory and how to solve the problem uh, that ghost can bring in a quantum field theory. And then I will also expose some prediction about inflation that we recently worked out with uh, Damiano and with Eugenio Bianchi. So <clears throat> I'm gonna use the first two slides to give you an overview um, of the talk also, uh, just to, in the way that you can keep in mind uh, the, the most important points, uh, what is the physical content of the theory and what are these results in uh, cosmology, for example. So let's start with an overview of this theory. First thing is to explain, at least in words for now, what is a purely virtual quantum. Also, we also call it FACON. So it is a degree of freedom that can uh, mediate interactions. It circulates inside loops of Feynman diagrams, but it cannot appear as external state in physical process. Uh, the usage of this uh, type of degrees of freedom is that we want to keep in quantum gravity, in higher derivative quantum gravity, we want to keep the properties that Ghost, uh, sorry, the uh, contribution that Ghost give to renormalization and uh, avoid to violate unitarity at the same time. So this is the job of this new type of uh, degree of freedom. In particular, the theory of quantum gravity in FACON has this content. So it's a, a quantum field theory of a, a massless spin two field, the graviton, a massive scalar field, the phi, the inflaton, and a massive spin two uh, field, which is the FACON. Parameters of this theory are uh, the Planck mass, cosmological constant, the mass of the inflaton, and the mass of the FACON chi. And in particular for the relevance of cosmology that I will talk about, um, the physical content is exhausted by scalar perturbation and tensor perturbations. And in particular, uh, there are no vector or additional tensors or scalars. So uh, let me anticipate also uh, the results in cosmology. So in particular, we computed the uh, amplitude and spectral indices in the sitter to the next to the leading order uh, in the sitter expansion. In this table, I collected the results in uh, the leading order. The black parts are the results in Starobinsky inflation, while the red parts uh, are the modification due to the presence of the phacon. You can see there is the mass of the phacon. We also derive a consistency, uh, sorry, from the consistency of this approach, this FACON approach, we derive a bound on the mass of the FACON with respect to the mass of the inflaton. And uh, thanks to this bound, we can also uh, narrow the window of allowed uh, values for the tensor to scalar ratio R, which I plotted here. So these are the uh, prediction, the results that we recently worked out in this paper. And I'm going to give some, I will comment more in more detail later about this. For the moment, I start to explain the, this idea of vacons. So as I said in the beginning, uh, the, the final goal is to uh, keep the two good property, uh, the, the good property of uh, higher derivative gravity and the good property of Einstein gravity. Einstein gravity is unitary, not renormalizable. The other one is renormalizable, but not unitary. So we want to reconcile these two properties. So let's start with unitarity and make some comment about it. So unitarity is a condition on the S matrix, which can be written in terms of the non-trivial part T. Uh, and then the unitarity equation looks like this one, which is often called optical theorem. Then uh, given a quantum field theory, there are a set of identities called cutting equations that they always hold by construction. 
Uh, they are diagrammatic equation, which means that they are valid diagram, Feynman diagram by Feynman diagram, but they can be recollected and they assume this form, which, um, the, which resembles the unitarity equation. So we call it pseudo unitarity equation. And in general, the, the, the difference in, uh, from the unitarity equation is this matrix H, which in general has uh, this uh, um, plus one and minus ones. So if you want to prove unitarity in a theory or try to understand if a theory is unitary or not, you have two possibilities. One possibility is, this, is that H is the identity. So the cutting equations are straight, uh, obviously the unitarity equations. And this is what happens in uh, standard theories. Uh, or you can have the identity in a subspace V, but you cannot simply uh, project naively, let's say, project uh, onto the subspace because quantum correction will resuscitate the states that you want to project away. So if you want to do really do a projection on a subspace where uh, your S matrix is unitary, you, do, you have to do something more than naively project. So, and I call this operation consistent projection. There are two known consistent projections. One is the fadev popov method, which is exactly what it does. And the other one is the Facon prescription. And roughly speaking, what, what these two procedures does is to set to zero instead uh, the, the minus one, so the signs that you don't like. And then you can really project onto the subspace and the theory will be unitary in the subspace. So let me uh, make a small historical, uh, historical from the point of view of our work, from where we started. Um, the, the starting point was a reformulation of Liebig models. So Liebig models are a class of higher derivative theories, uh, which has uh, schematically a propagator like this one. So you have a standard term uh, times a polynomial of degree n, which has complex conjugated pairs of zeros, so the propagator have complex conjugated pairs of poles. Uh, Lee and Vick propose a way to prescribe such theories, uh, but what we shown in this paper, in our early paper, is that uh, the, their proposal is incomplete and lead to some inconsistencies, including certain uh, prescription, for example, the so-called Klopp prescription, uh, Katkowski and these other people, uh, which we also show that it's uh, uh, inconsistent. And we prove that the right way to formulate this type of theories is to define them in Euclidean space-time and then perform an operation that we called non-analytical weak rotation, which amounts to uh, deform the domain integration uh, in a similar way that they propose, but we extended this idea before to weak rotate. Or we can also prove that instead of doing this operation, we can use a simple formula that we called average, operation, uh, average continuation. Uh, this will be clear in the next two slides. Now, the, the, the main message of this, uh, of this slide is just that uh, we started to work on these things. We work out this, uh, um, this formula and this definition, which is the only way to have a consistent definition for these theories. And this operation, this analytic, non-analytical weak rotation, gives exactly what I mentioned before, namely a consistent projection. So the theory projected onto the cell space where the poles associated to this part uh, are removed is unitary if you use this uh, definition. Problem is, uh, at that time, uh, thanks to this uh, work, to these results, the super normalizable theories of quantum gravity were available. So for example, a model of quantum gravity like this one would be if defined in this way and if these polynomials are of the Liebig type, would be a viable, unitary, and super normalizable theory of gravity. The problem was that there is a still a problem of uniqueness because there was, there was no way to fix this polynomial. Which polynomial, which degree? They should be different, they should be the same. If they satisfy the Liebig conditions, then they were all okay. So what we wanted to do uh, was to find a way to uh, get rid of the, in a similar way, get rid of the ghost in Stelle theory, which is the only unique is the unique theory which is strictly randomizable in four dimension. So to understand what we did, let's start with a standard case and see what happened in the usual way to in the usual theories, because this solution was in the end to 
change the prescription for the propagator. So uh, consider a standard propagator like this one. Uh, this propagator, this object is, a, is not a well-defined distribution. Usually you need a prescription. And a choice of the prescription is reflected on the choice uh, for the prescription for the amplitude. And an amplitude can be viewed as a complex function. This complex function will have branch cut in the complex plane. And when you have a branch cut and you want to define a function on that branch cut, uh, you need to specify if you are reaching uh, the branch cut, for example, from above or from below. And the choice of the propagator of the prescription reflects on the is reflected on the choice on how to circumvent the cuts. So what happens in usual theories that you have this propagator, if the sign, the residue here is positive and you use the usual Feynman prescription, uh, you will have what we call standard particle. If you have a minus sign, uh, then you use the Feynman prescription and you, we have what we usually call a ghost. This choice is reflected in the amplitude. This, for example, is the branch structure of um, a one loop amplitude, for example. This choice uh, is uh, equivalent to define, co compute the amplitude in the Euclidean space, and then do this uh, analytic continuation from above the cut. So Feynman prescription means defining things above the cuts with analytic continuation from above. So then we had, uh, then, then Damiano in this paper had the idea of use what we had done before to uh, apply our proof of unitarity also in the case where the poles are not uh, on the complex plane, but they are on the real axis. So instead of using the final prescription, we multiply and divide by k square minus m square, and we add a fictitious uh, mass, a fictitious scale, which played the similar role as the i epsilon in the case of Feynman. Besides this, we also have to do this uh, integration domain that I mentioned, the integration domain deformation that I mentioned before to have uh, a good theory and a consistent projection. So this, um, this operation in terms of the amplitude means that we, what we've shown was that this is equivalent at the level of the amplitude to, choi to choose this, um, to perform this uh, average continuation. So it's just the arithmetic average of the analytic continuation from above and the one from below. So basically we turn this theory into a Liebig theory for some intermediate step. Then we apply our methods of Le that we use to treat Liebig theories. Then we send epsilon to zero and we show that, there's no, that the, the unitarity still holds in the subspace, pr projected subspace. And this was shown in this paper. So to, to summarize a little bit, because there might be some confusion between different models or what you can find in the literature and what are the different approach. So consider a propagator of this, like this one, which is of the Liebig type. Now you can forget about the numerator because the important things are the poles. And so regardless you have this propagator because you have for real a Liebig theory or because you use the Facon prescription, so you introduce this scale and so on. So let's just consider this propagator. And suppose you want to compute the, a bubble diagram. So it's just the product of two propagators. So we can have Minkowski models. And with this, I mean that you integrate, for example, in a one loop diagram, both the energy and the space uh, momentum on real values. If you do so, and you have theories like this, of course they are not unitary because they have ghosts. But uh, in 2017, Aglietti and Anselmi also shown that this theory has non-local and non-Hermitian divergences. Even the starting theory is uh, local and Hermitian, which is even worse than violate unitarity. Then you have the Liebig models. Liebig models uh, uh, propose to, Lee and Vick propose to modify the contour integration for the energy in some specific way, but keep fixed the space momentum on the real values. This, as I explained before, has uh, some inconsistencies and it is uh, basically it's incomplete. They missed some point, although it was the good starting point. Um, they have inconsistency in higher loops. This was also acknowledged by them and they also the amplitude violates Lorentz invariance, which was showed up, shown by Nakanishi. Then we have the FACOM models. FACOM models 
We deform the energy contour as Lee and Vic suggest, but we also deform the space momenta contour integration in a specific way such that theory is unitary, you don't have these uh, ambiguities, and the amplitude are, not, are Lorentz invariant. Instead of doing this, we can always use the average continuation, which is uh, much way uh, simple, but this was useful to prove uh, unitarity at every order. The last comment I want to do um, on this is that the frequent propagator is not the Cauchy principal value. So this was the, uh, the um, frequent propagator. If you take the distributional limit of this object, this uh, one can wrongly think that is the principal value. But this is true only if you perform integrals like this, like the Minkowski model on the real axis. Because this is true if you do integral on this domain. But we use this propagator with this deformed contour. So this is not true. However, at three level, you don't have to compute um, loops, three level or classical level. You don't have to compute loops. So you can really take the limit uh, directly on the distribution without considering any deformation. And then it's really the principal value. So at three level, the FACON distribution, let me call it like that, reduces to the principal value. But this is true only at three level. If you use this propagator inside loops, you will, get, you will go back to problem like this one, non-local and non-hermitian divergences. And this was shown recently in this paper. And this is uh, at three level, this, this is okay. And this is exactly what we did in the case of cosmology to compute cosmological perturbation at three level. So at this point, we can apply uh, what we've learned about this uh, new type of, um, of propagators to this theory. So if you have, uh, we consider this theory, the properties are that uh, they are unitary. And is, is this theory is unitary, is renormalizable. The, a consequence of the fact that we introduce a fake one instead of a ghost is that we have a violation of microcausality uh, of small scales, but no violation of macrocausality. So then we can compute some uh, things from this theory, extract some phenomenology. So first, is it possible to, um, it is possible to write an equivalent action introducing auxiliary fields and perform some uh, transformations? Then you end up with uh, this action, which contains the Einstein Hilbert term, contains uh, an action for the Facon field, which is a Pauli field with the wrong sign, plus some uh, complicated interactions. And um, an action for the scalar field, which is the same as in, uh, is a scalar field with Starobinsky potential, the usual one. Then you can also couple matter, standard model, and this will couple with all the fields in this, uh, in this way. So in, in our paper, we compute the self energy of all of these fields. In particular, you can compute um, the frequent self energy and resum them at one loop around the peak of the mass of its renormalized mass. So you can extract the width of this phacon. So the width of the phacon is negative, and this is a signal of uh, violation of microcausality. You can easily see that if you consider this propagator is a distribution of the Brett Wigner type, and if you perform the Fourier anti-transform, you get this distribution, and you see that gamma is inside the argument of theta. So if gamma is negative, theta picks the future instead of the past in the convolution. So uh, we have to give, uh, anyway, we have to give an interpretation to this quantity because uh, as I said in the beginning, facons are purely virtual quanta, which means that they are only off shell. They are only, medi only mediate interaction, but they never leave. So in particular, the inverse of the width is usually uh, interpreted as the lifetime of a particle, but these are not normal particles. These are different things. These are virtual states, only virtual states. So there's no lifetime associated to them. But still you can compute this quantity and you can associate it some time scale to this uh, uh, object. And then we interpret the, this time scale, the absolute value, as uh, the duration of this violation of microcausality. So just to give some number, if the mass of the phacon is about 10 to 12 GV, this violation is 10 to minus 20 seconds, which is three order more 
uh, than uh, three order smaller than the shortest time interval ever measured. So which is defined. And so the physical interpretation of this is that this time scale associated to the FACON is um, the time scale where causality to lose meaning. And when we say that causality lose meaning, we don't mean that some weird things happen like uh, decays happens before the scattering or the sons uh, born before the mother or things like that. We just say that below this scale, uh, this concept cause and effect just lose meaning. In the same way that uh, when you pass from classical mechanics, uh, position and momentum uh, lose meaning, you, you need you need the wave function to describe things instead of positions. Uh, so it's this sort of anal analogy. Uh, let's see now, let's move now to cosmology because uh, this uh, violation of microcausality uh, can, can be detected somehow, not that we detect a macrocausality violation, but you can see some effect, but still you need to do a very high, very, very high energy scattering, which is, it will be forever unavailable, that's case. So we have to try to work out something else that we can actually measure. And this is cosmological perturbations. So let's see how we did that. Um, so at classical level, uh, I remind you, uh, in the quantum version of the FACON prescription, you have to compute amplitudes in this way, using this, the amplitude associated with production of what would be a ghost. If you want to project it away, you have to use this amplitude. Uh, but the, at classical level, you don't have to compute amplitudes, so you can directly use this average on the green function, which gives you what I call the fake on green function. That is the average between the retarded and the advanced uh, green function. So just to uh, make you understand what I mean, suppose that V is a uh, fake on. This is, these are the, is the fake on equation of motion. Then you have to invert this operator by means of its green function. So you have to solve this uh, uh, equation in this way. And then this G is fixed by the prescription, not by any uh, initial condition. And this G is the green function, which is obtained in the usual way. So in flat space time, where this quantity is constant, the green function has this form. Uh, we work out also uh, the same in the Sitter space time, which is more complicated. The J's are the Bessel functions, and this NK is a constant, which uh, depends on which perturb cosmological perturbation you are considering, which type, scalar, tensor, but it's a constant. And this is all what you need to compute in this formalism, in this theory, uh, the effect of cosmological perturbation and the effect of phacons on uh, power spectra. So you have to work out what we call the projected action. So suppose you have an action, which depends on two fields, U and V, and suppose that V is the, is the FACON field, so it's the one that you want to project away. Classically, what you have to do is solve the equation of motion in this way, put it back, and then you have what I call the projected equation, which will depend on your new via solution of the equation of motion for V. But let's see in details for cosmological perturbation. So, Sorry, yeah. you have uh, four more minutes. Okay, yeah, we're almost finished. Thank you. So <clears throat> we did the usual background. Um, we expanded around the usual background, Friedman one. We defined the usual parameter, epsilon and eta. Then generic action for a cosmological perturbation as this form, generic uh, cosmological perturbation U, I call it U. And you have this higher derivative term. Then you can introduce auxiliary variable. You get this action. You see that uh, U has the correct sign, so that's the standard particle. And V has the wrong sign, so this is what has to be turned into a ghost. So without giving too many details, the simplified procedure for three-level computation in this case is, uh, works as follows. First, solve the equation of motion of V, as I explained before, using the Fagon Green function. Then you put it back in the uh, action, S prime then you obtain what I call the projected action and you quantize that projected action. This operation involved many things, but in our paper, we were uh, 
because of many reasons, uh, thanks to the CITER expansion and other considerations, we were always able to recast the projected action into the Mucano form. And then from this point on, uh, we just apply the usual method to work out the power spectrum. The last thing I want to mention was uh, the bound that I told you we found out on the mass of the FACON, um, which uh, works, uh, which is um, extracted from the consistency of the approach. So the FACON approach works for particles, works for ghost, which means that we can turn particle into FACON, we can turn ghost into FACON, but we cannot turn tachyon into FACON. So we have to fix a no tachyon condition. If you do that around flat space time, you get um, you fix the sign in front of R squared and uh, Y squared. If you fix this in uh, cosmological space time, then you get the condition that I told you. So all the equation of motion of the FACON has this form where MT is an effective mass, which has this form. And if we impose the not attacking condition in the super horizon limit, we get that this N key, the constant that I told you depends on the perturbation, has to be real. This you can see it also from the green function because in this limit uh, it goes to this. And if n chi is uh, imaginary, then this sign is an hyperbolic one and it will be divergent, some, it will explode in some point. So applying, the, imposing this condition to every perturbation, every phacon perturbation that we have to project away, they all give the same bound, which is this one uh, with respect to the mass of the inflaton. So putting all together, then I'm finished. Uh, the leading order, I repeat, just repeat what I showed you in the beginning. This is the results of the leading order. The scalar parts are, are modified at this order. The tensor parts are modified all by this factor, which contains the mass of the phacon. At this order is still valid this relation, which usually is, uh, is true for single field inflation. Then we also work out the higher order corrections. Um, and uh, using the bound that I told you about the mass, we can extract from Planck. We use we take nr, the tilt of the scar from Planck 2018. Then from this prediction, we extract the number of e-fold. And from this bound, we can put a window for the allowed value of the tensor to scalar ratio. So if you plot them, you have the red curve, which is Starobinsky inflation. You have the blue curve, which is the lower bound given by this relation. These two black lines are the number of e-fold extracted from Planck. So the colored region in the middle is the allowed region of values for the tensor to scalar ratio. Just to give some number, if n is equal to 60, then you have this relation, this, um, these two conditions, which is just one order of difference between the two. So, to conclude, uh, thanks to this new idea of purely virtual quanta, we can uh, provide a local, unitary, and renormalizable theory of gravity. This theory is essentially unique. It has the computational power, a very strong computational power, because uh, there's no much more effort with respect to the standard model computations or any field theory, local field theory. Uh, it is predictive. And indeed, it's also falsifiable, as I show you uh, from our last paper, because we compute these amplitudes. They relate uh, the mass of the phacon with the mass of the inflaton with data. So once we will have uh, um, more cosmological data, we will have fixed both the mass of the inflaton and the mass of the phacon. Then all the parameters of the theory will be fixed. And every other prediction that we can work out will be uh, a stringent test for this theory. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. The questions or comments? Um, hi. Um, hi. I, I was just curious. Uh, so, uh, have you considered how would the reheating proceed in your inflation model? Can you repeat, please? So, no, I'm. I'm just asking. Uh, how how would the, the uh, reheating proceed um, proceed in your in inflation model? Have you con ah. considered? So um, I'm looking at that uh, because I'm not an expert on inflation, so I'm learning new things, things that are new for me. Um, I, I'm not 100% sure, sure about the answer, but I uh, can tell you that is, 
this should work uh, in the same way as in Starobinsky because we we computed the uh, the width of the of the scalar and that's the same as in Starobinsky so it depends only on the deviation from the conformal coupling with the scalar with scalars uh, so at least if it, if that is the important parameter so the width because then the inverse is uh, roughly how long reheating is should be the same but uh, i i'm not sure i still have to investigate okay. thank, there are thank some you. additional contributions okay thank you other questions or comments may i ask I, a question uh, yeah yeah hi. yes uh, it's uh, alfio uh, hi marco uh, i want to ask you the following it seems to me that you use a conformal transformation in the paper is that which, correct which which paper? You went to the conformal frame in your cosmological paper. Uh, we, this is, you stayed exactly in the Jordan frame to obtain we, this we did numbers. Both, we did both the frame. I have, I have a slide for this. Yeah, wait. Um, so we, we worked in this frame. I don't know how to call them because there is this vi squared. So my, this is the analogy of Jordan frame because everything okay. is geometry. And this is uh, somehow the analogy of Einstein because we turned the scalar into, sorry, the R square into the scalar, but we kept the, the vi squared. Yeah. We did the computation in both, but then when you write everything in terms of number of defaults, uh, there's no difference between the results in the two frames. But okay, there's no difference. But if you, I don't understand one thing. If you, if you imagine that you have, we want to set the vacuum condition at very high momentum modes for the bunch Davis vacuum. Mm -hmm. uh, in your case, you have a box plus box square operator, something like that. No, no. So no. yes, you must have that. No, because you project the action, then you fix the condition. So you have a two derivative action. So what is the, the then the, the spectrum? The, is the spectrum more blue or more red at high momentum? What is your the initial condition for the primordial spectrum? What will that be? That's the same as uh, in, in user case, like in So basically, there is no way of uh, of um, uh, say falsifying this theory. Why the the power spectra has. As this, yes, this n, uh, you forget about that. I mean, you can change n, so you will not see anything. Mm -hmm. n can be really not very much constrained. This doesn't depend on n, and this has the mass of the inflaton and the mass of the. Yeah, I think we, 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 want, we will only be able to get r, but not at. In the best uh, of the possible world, we will get a, a better uh, constraint on r. But not on AT. I don't think what which which uh, experiments uh, would you think we we can use to constrain the, the amplitude of ten, tensorial modes. I think the best one can do is uh, Lightbird, but Lightbird will give us something on R. So this the conclusion of your talk it seems that to me that, that, that there is no real possibility of uh, of testing the theory with the future with the future mission unless. Uh, but we, we have an R, right? We, we, we might have R from Lightbird in maybe in the next uh, five, six years, but only R. We have the scalar tilt that fixes N. This one. This is from uh, Planck 2018, no? This is what I showed here. This. This yeah, fixes this N. This is, but basically every, everybody gets this number. No, I don't say that I get this number. I say the experiment that get this number. So this is... So, but you want to constrain the theory. What, what would be really the, the, I mean, the, the case you want to make that uh, where, how do we, what do we have to look for really constraining the theory and uh, saying, for instance, that uh, Starobinsky is wrong and uh, Fakians is, is correct. We, which data we, we, we have to look AT. at? It's, it's unclear to me. AT or R? Whatever, whatever data has this uh, modification in it, because it has the mass of the paper, which is 
is, these are the parts which differ from Starobinsky. Okay, but uh, then, but uh, then R, what, uh, what is the, uh, can you show the latest version of your R, the, this, this picture? So what is the prediction for R in your case? This. And if you put N, you extract yeah, but N. N, I said, it can be 50 or, or 60. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's not very constrained, N. Well, it's one order. I only one order 20 one. constrained on, R, on N. I don't what? think even, even 50 will make it or 65. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there is this gray area. It's the gray area. If it gray area is, is okay, is, if it is no, outside, there is no, there okay. Is no real, okay, the gray area means that there is no real, uh, I mean, there is a lot of room for anything. It's an area, so there is a room. Yeah. No, there is room. Okay, that, that, that is my point. I, I never say that it's I have difficult a... difficult to make. A, it's difficult. It's really difficult at the moment to rule out. Uh, to I don't think so. Prediction. I think that this is a very sharp prediction. It's less than an order of magnitude, and R has to be found there, otherwise the theory is wrong. Exactly. Okay, sorry. Uh, okay, thank you very much. It was in, uh, sorry, uh, Marco, but I mean, it's, it's an important point, and uh, thank you for answering that. Oh, sure. We have... Hi, I, 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 I just want to, wanted to uh, say one thing. So, so I, I was asking my uh, reheating re question from the same point, point of view. So maybe, maybe the reheating will be able to distinguish between the uh, Starobinsky prediction and your model, uh, provided how, how much you're getting the amplitude of the impeton field or like how exactly how the reheating pro uh, proceeds. Uh, can be a good uh, candidate. I mean, can be a good uh, way to understand the difference between the degeneracy that uh, uh, Alfio was asking. Okay, I uh, I told you I don't know <clears throat> exactly mm -hmm. right now uh, if there will be a difference in specifically in reheating. Uh, my my naive understanding for the moment is that there are no, but uh, I'm not oh, sure. I can okay. 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 Thanks. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. So now it's time to move to the last speaker.